And as the fans flow to Three Rivers for game four, the Orioles are confident that no one can stop them now. On the other hand, the fighting spirit of the swashbuckling Buccaneers still sounds the familiar battle cry. You're in our ballpark. We all thought that we were coming home to win the series. And as game three got underway, the Pirates rode that confidence to a fast start. Lined in the left center field and off the gap. With one in the first and two in the second, the Bucks led 3-0. And this club is alive. But the Orioles hadn't won 102 regular season games by accident. And Weaver's mastery of the platoon showed when part-time starters Benny Ayala and Kiko Garcia had big hits to keep Baltimore's comeback. Line into right center field, all the way to the wall as Dower comes in to score. Dempsey comes in to score. They are waving McGregor in. It's a three-run triple. Weaver has the look of a genius at the moment. Earl Weaver knew exactly what he could get out of his players. He knew how to platoon them. He knew how to use them. Ayala and Garcia drove in six of the eight Oriole runs, giving Baltimore a two-to-one series lead. The Baltimore Orioles come from behind to win game number three. ABC Sports presents the 1979 World Series. From Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, it's the American League champion Baltimore Orioles against the National League champion Pittsburgh Pirates. This ABC Sports exclusive is brought to you by B.F. Goodrich, where the other guys, the leader in high-performance radio, and by Timex. Timex has watches for any gift occasion. Timex, the up-to-the-minute gift. Well, in Pittsburgh, it is still nippy, but the sun is shining. Temperature in the low 40s. There are predictions of possible snow flurries later, but clearly the playing conditions the best that we have yet had in this World Series. Hello again, everyone, and it's so good to have you with us for this, what clearly is the pivotal game of the 1979 World Series. It is that by manager Chuck Tanner's own admission. Only three times in the history of the World Series has a team ever come back from a three to one deficit in games to win the series. And that's what the Bucks would face if they lost today. Those three times, 1968, the Tigers did it against the Cardinals, the Lola year. 1958, the Yankees did it against the Milwaukee Braves. And then in 1925, these same Pittsburgh Pirates did it against the then Washington Senators. We're going to recap the highlights of the series thus far for you in just a moment. This has been a suspense-filled and dramatic series thus far, but it's also seen some shoddy fielding play by both teams. We want to take you back in time to the highlights of the three previous games. Game number one. Played at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. First inning, Lowenstein grounds to Garner. Simple double play. Garner throws errantly. And this was the key to a five-run inning for the Birds. That made it two to nothing at that point. But the inning was capped by the third baseman, Doug DeCense, with a two-run blast deep into the left field seats. The Birds had assumed a five to nothing lead. But the Bucks, who keep battling back, scratching and clawing, gave evidence of that. Garner singled in two runs. That reduced the lead to five to three. And then in the eighth inning, Willie Stodgill, the great one, golfed that pitch just to his liking, deep into the right field seats. That made it five to four. But it was a case of too little, too late. Flanagan held on. The Birds won it, five to four. Game number two, Matlock singling in Stodgill with the first Pirate run. That came in the second inning. They added another run, a two to nothing lead. In the bottom of the second, Eddie Murray struck back. Hit that one deep into right field, just fair. Middle deck, 
of the ballpark. It became two to one. In the sixth inning, Murray would strike again. And right there he did, lashing a double into the left center alley, scoring Kenny Singleton, who had singled before him. That made it two to two. But after a failure to capitalize on an opportunity in the bottom of the eighth, Manny Sanguian for the Bucks came through with this single. The controversial play, the cutoff by Murray, the slide by Ott, safe, three to two Bucks. The game's knotted at one victory apiece. And then there was yesterday. And Bill Garner again with a double into left center. And that put the are the Bucks ahead at that time, three to nothing. But quickly, the Birds rebounded. Benny Ayala with that drive over the left center field fence with a man on. That made it three to two. And then, after an hour and seven minute rain delay, well, Candelaria to Kiko Garcia, who came out of oblivion with that three run trip which put the birds ahead at that point five to three later they upped the lead in the same inning it was a five run outburst to seven to three and then it was phil garner for the final out scott mcgregor pitched brilliantly after the rain delay the birds had won it eight to four taking a two to one lead in games we'll be back with a talk with buck manager chuck tanner in a moment Chuck Tanner is an enthusiastic man who has managed in both leagues. Players love to play for him. He lets them do their thing. His record speaks for itself on that graphic. I talked with Chuck Tanner just a few moments ago. Chuck, the day after, do you have any second thoughts about coming back with the candy man after the long rain delay? Oh, none whatsoever, Hard. Uh, Harvey Haddix, our pitching coach, was in the bullpen with him when he warmed up. He came back and he said he's throwing a ball just like he did before he started the ball game. And the only difference was he just didn't get location. And you know, Harry, we had a couple couple tough spots in that ball game. We thought we had two of their batters struck out. One walked and the other guy hit the home run. And to me, that was the turning point. And then after the rain delay, they were able to come back and hit the ball in the alleys. We hit the ball hard, but our balls just didn't go out. Well, certainly there were three that looked like they would go out, and each was caught right at the wall. Do you hold the heavy air accountable? No question about it. Under normal conditions, uh, we would have had three home runs, and the game would have been completely different. Well, that was shortened to the point. <laughs> now, what dampening effect, if any, did that defeat have on your ball club, and maybe you personally? Oh, no effect with me, no effect with our ball players. We know that we're down by one game. We know today's a very important game for us, a game that w may be the biggest game of the World Series because we can't afford to be down three to one. We have to get it back to two and two, and then we'll be able to go from there. Uh, it's the biggest game for us. We have Jim Bibby going, and everybody knows the job. We don't have to have a meeting. We don't have to discuss it. Uh, they'll be ready. They're in there getting ready for batting practice right now, and they definitely feel that we're going to still win the pennant. What has Bibby got to stop the birds? Well, Bibby is, was, he and Keeson have been our most effective pitchers coming down the stretch in September. And Bibby is a different pitcher than he was in the American League. Baltimore hit against Bibby in the American League when he was strictly a fastball pitcher. Pump the heat at you for nine innings and let's see who the better person is. But now Jim Bibby is, with the help of Harvey Haddix, has come up with a breaking pitch an off-speed pitch to go along with his good fastball, so he's a completely different pitcher than he was when he was in the American League. Okay. Good luck to you, Skipper. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Chuck Tanner, who hardly has the luck or sound of the defeated, will be back in just a moment. An exclusive presentation of ABC Sports. The 1979 World Series, Game 4. Live from Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh, the American League champion Baltimore Orioles and the National League champion Pittsburgh Pirates. The Orioles go up two games to one. Last night's game delayed an hour and seven minutes by rain. The key blow here, a three-run triple in a five-run fourth inning by Kiko Garcia as the Orioles overcame an early Pirate lead and never looked back. 
The other big man, Scott McGregor, struggled in the early going, then finished with a flourish, retiring the last 11 in a row. Today, game four. Pittsburgh, the temperature in the mid 40s, but at least the sun is shining. Relatively speaking, compared to the last three nights, it feels like we're in Palm Springs. The Baltimore Orioles, the Pittsburgh Pirates, ready for game number four. And this ABC Sports exclusive is brought to you by Gillette, makers of the Track 2 Twin Blade Shaving System with Micro Smooth Blades. By Chevrolet, like baseball hot dogs and apple pie, Chevy is an American favorite. See the exciting new lineup of 1980 Chevrolets at your Chevy dealer. And by Pepsi-Cola and your local Pepsi-Cola bottler. Have a Pepsi day. Hello again, everybody. I'm Al Michaels, and I think Chuck Tanner summed it up. All the pressure today really on Pittsburgh. The Baltimore Orioles, if they were to lose today, would still be in good shape, obviously. We would then be down to a best-of-three situation, and two of those three games would be played Tuesday and Wednesday night in Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. Tanner, of course, exudes optimism and confidence and enthusiasm, as do the Pirates. And it's interesting to note with the Pittsburgh Pirate Ball Club, they are in good measure like some of the other championship teams in the 70s, the Oakland A's in the early 70s, the Cincinnati Reds in the mid-70s. As they approach key, crucial situations, key games, they approach them in a mood of lightness and looseness and frivolity almost. I think the best illustrated would be some banner around the batting cage today between Bill Garner, the second baseman, and Bill Madlock, the third baseman. Madlock, a two-time National League batting champion. He's three for 11 in the World Series. Garner comes up to him and he says, when are you going to get a hit? Garner, of course, has had his problems defensively, and Madlock looks over at Phil and he says, when are you going to make a play? And everybody got a kick out of it, of course, and uh, that sort of, I think, sums up the mood of the Pittsburgh Pirates as they approach what is, as Chuck Tanner said, probably the most important game of the World Series. Back again to offer his commentary today, and I'm sure to predict all of Benny Ayala's home runs. Once again, Howard Cosell. Thank you very much, Al. It may seem like Palm Springs to you, but it's Nova Scotia to me. In the meantime, you're right about the looseness of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Matt Locke, for instance, was shadow boxing, showing his Sugar Ray Leonard moves. Willie Stodgill was impressing me with the fact that he could have been the greatest goalie in the history of the National Hockey League. No matter. We made a point at the opening of our very first telecast that frequently the little guys, the unexpected ones, become the World Series heroes. And so far, it's run to that pattern. Remember the very first game? On balance, Doug DeSensei had to be the hero, providing the winning margin with his two-run blast. And in the second game, it was the elder statesman who did it for Roberto Clemente, in his own words, Manny Sanguin. And then yesterday, rocketing into stardom the way you can in a World Series, a guy named Kiko Garcia with those four hits, with the four runs batted in, the big bases loaded triple. And for him, it'll be probably the most memorable day of his baseball life. In the meantime, pitching still the controlling factor. Look at McGregor yesterday. Today, maybe the situation a little bit iffy on both sides. To detail that for you, Don Drysdale. Thank you, Howard. Well, iffy might be the case, but if both guys are on, it could be a very well-pitched ball game. For Baltimore, it will be Dennis Martinez. Now, he's had kind of an up-and-down year. He started off 0-2, then he won his next 10 in a row. But after that, he ended up the season by winning 5 and losing 14. But he's got great stuff, and if he's right, he can be awfully tough. He pitched against the Angels in the championship series. He had no decision. Now, for Pittsburgh, it is Jim Bibby. He's a big guy. He throws hard. And the key to watching Bibby is going to be his control. He was inserted in the starting lineup by manager Chuck Tanner in July. And then he won six in a row. He finished 12 and four. And if he's right, his control is right. That is his key. As I said before, this can be a well-pitched ball game and maybe a low-scoring ball game. That's the story on the two pitchers right now. Let's meet the players and Art McKenna, the public address speaker. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are the starting lineups for today's game. First, for the champions of the American League, the Baltimore Orioles, manager Earl Weaver.
Leading off, center fielder Al Bunbury. Batting second, the shortstop, Kiko Garcia. Hitting third, right fielder Ken Singleton. In the cleanup position, first baseman, Eddie Murray. The fifth hitter, third baseman, Doug Desense. Batting sixth, left fielder, Gary Renicky. In the seventh spot, second baseman, Rich Dower. Hitting eighth, catcher Dave Skaggs. Batting ninth and warming up in the bullpen, pitcher Dennis Martinez. And the remainder of the Orioles. Now your National League champion, Pittsburgh Pirates. Manager Chuck Tanner. The lead-off hitter, center fielder Omar Moreno. Batting second, shortstop Tim Foley. The third place hitter, right fielder Dave Parker. Hitting fourth, first baseman Willie Stargell. In the fifth spot, left fielder John Milner. Batting six, batting third baseman, third Bill Madlock. The seventh place seventh hitter, hitter, catcher Ed Ott. Ed Ott. Hitting eight, second baseman, second baseman Bill Garner. Garner. In the ninth in the position, ninth position and warming up in the bullpen, the pitcher, Jim Bibby. And the rest and of the Pirates. The Pirates. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise to honor America with our national anthem, which will be sung this afternoon by Billy Eckstein. So proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er oh, the ramparts we. So gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, came through through the night that our flag was. Still there. 
Eckstein. Well, the game is half as good as the anthem, we're in for a beauty. Billy Eckstein in his hometown of Pittsburgh. We're set. Game number four. Baltimore leading two games to one. The Orioles and the Pirates. Now there's an easier way to get the official 1979 World Series Baseball. Take advantage of this special Major League Baseball offer and get the official World Series ball. Send $9.95 to Major League Baseball, Box 9884, St. Paul, Minnesota, 55198. That's Major League Baseball, Box 9884, St. Paul, Minnesota, 55198. The preceding was a message on behalf of Major League Baseball. We turn your attention to the commissioner's box, which is located at the first base end of the Pirates' dugout. Today's ceremonial first pitch will be made by the general manager of the world champion Pirates in 1960 and 1971, Joe L. Brown. Thank you. Kick. A lot of motion, no fast The ceremonial first pitch, the longtime general manager retired after the 1976 season and a man who certainly was instrumental in putting together the current Pittsburgh Pirate Club. The Oriole lineup with Al Bunbury back in the starting lineup today. He got into last night's game as a pinch hitter then stayed in. Of course, the big man last night was Garcia with Singleton, Murray, DeSensei hitting fifth. Gary Renicky gets the start in left. Dower, Skaggs, and Martinez. There is Dennis Martinez, still engaged in his warm-up. Rick Dempsey, Dempsey getting a rest today, but a man who knows Martinez now, inside out. Accordingly, I spoke with Rick and asked him to tell all of you about that man, Dennis Martinez. Tell us about Dennis Martinez. Dennis probably has the, has the capability of throwing the best stuff uh, of any pitcher on our staff. He throws harder, I think, than Flanagan, even though his ball doesn't move as much. But he's got a real hard curveball, a hard slider, and an average changeup. When he learns his, a good changeup like Flanagan, he's going to be as good or better than uh, Mike, I think. Not only that, he's had the rest he needed. He definitely has the rest now. You know, the second half of the season, uh, he didn't uh, have impressive statistics. He threw some good ball games, but he just wasn't shutting people out, uh, the, the teams that he should, or keeping them to one and two runs. He's young. He's going to make mistakes, but uh, he's learning, and uh, we just we're, we got a good game out of him in California. We should have won that ball game, and then he had more confidence against Pittsburgh. But he reminds me more of a National League pitcher. He'll go after you with that hard stuff. And uh, he reminds me a lot of Burt Blylevin in a way because Burt has the hard curveball and the hard fastball. But Dennis, um, like I just say, it's a learning process for him. And uh, once he learns uh, how to throw a real good ball game, he's going to be one of the toughest pitchers in the league to beat. Of course, Skaggs is catching Dennis today, not Rick. But Rick, of course, we've talked enough about him. A great catcher, knows his people inside out. Al? The Pirates out on the field defensively with the right-hander going for Baltimore. It's John Milner who gets the start in left field. Omar Marino, the key man in the buck attack, sets the table in the leadoff spot. Was one for ten in the first two games, but had two hits last night. Dave Parker in right field who has made a couple of scintillating plays already in the first three games in the infield bill madlock at third the shortstop over from the mets in april in a key deal at sent to new york tim foley phil garner has been up and down he's made some fine plays and of course it was his error in the first inning in the first game that was instrumental in the Baltimore win. And Willie Stargell at first base. If this were the regular season, Stargell would probably be off today, sitting out a day game following a night game, but it's not the regular season. Ed Ott is back of the plate again. Ott being platooned with Nikosha during the series, and Eddie starting against the right-hander. And on the mound, Jim Bibby of tight end dimension, 6'5", 242 pounder, 34 years old, born in Franklinton, North Carolina, lives now in Madison Heights, Virginia. 
Al Bunbury to lead off. There are the umpires. National League umpire back of the play today. Terry Tata, Jim McKean of the American at first. Paul Runge, National second. Jerry Newdecker, American third. Bob Engel, National left field line. Russ Getz, American on the right field line. Oh, and one account. Well, I said at the top, you've got to watch the control of Bibby. If he's got control, he can be awfully tough. And Al, like you said, he's a big guy. He's really huge out there. He's awesome, and he throws hard. But his main key, he will not work fast. He's a fairly slow worker, but he has got to throw strikes. You can say that just about for anybody, but in Bibby's case, that has been his reputation at Texas, at Cleveland, before coming over here to Pittsburgh. Gave the Pirates a good outing in game two of the playoffs against Cincinnati. Fouled away, and the count on Bunbury is one and two. He is a classic example of what you would call Kentucky windage on that mound because unlike most right-handers, if you watch Bibby, he stands on the first base side of the mound. Now, he has done this because he has been wild, standing from the middle of the mound to the others to the right-hand side, the third base side. He's moved over on this side to try and capture that control. The one-two pitch is hit in the air down the left field line and curling back toward the corner and back out of play as Milner runs out of room. They've just had a quick gun on him right off the bat, and he's up in the low 90s, 93, 94. So as I said, he can throw hard. Three and two. Just missing. There's what makes it tough on an umpire. He's been high with every pitch. Ball's high. The high strikes. Bumbley has fouled away. And now all of a sudden he comes back with a pitch that you might say is really a borderline pitch. That makes it tough on an umpire. Bumbley hits it down to Garner. One away. Kiko Garcia coming up. Four hits last night before the game. Howard visited with him. Kiko, describe your feelings that suddenly coming from relative oblivion to being a World Series hero. Well, that's a good feeling. I'm just glad um, I got a chance to pick up some of the guys because they picked me up pretty much all year long. So um, I was glad I had a good day, finally. You didn't have a... A good day is understating it. One out, base is empty in the first inning. One and oh. One and one to count on Kiko Garcia. There was a 96 mile an hour fastball. That's the second one he's had so far. And that's what Tim Bibby's fastball will do. There's some graphics to look at right there. Five pretty times. Pretty good company. I would say pretty good company. Oh. Here's the 1-1 one, one pitch. Swung out and missed, and the count one and two. And Jim Bibby keeps that ball down like that. If he can keep the control and keep it down, that ball is going to tail and sink on him, and that makes him double tough because then when he comes up, he's got the velocity to make that ball take off. It'll well, ride. You heard Chuck Tanner say he's become a pitcher. He wasn't the pure power thrower that he was in the American League. Garcia is certainly a better hitter than his 247 seasons average would indicate. Not just because of the four hits yesterday and the base clearing triple, but because he has a solid compact swing. He's a good line drive hitter, and he can surprise you with a clutch home run here and there. He did that during the season. He only had five in total, but a couple of them were game winning blows. The one two pitch to Garcia. Swung out and foul tip and held by Ox strike three. So Bibby has come out smoking. Two down. Well, you can see Ott with a fastball. The location right inside. He's holding his glove there. He's not looking for any curveball, and he just throws it by him. Perfect location. Two down, base is empty, and Ken Singleton is the batter. That's a little misleading, that 333 average. Ken is honestly disappointed with the series he's been having thus far. He had two critical strikeouts, one with men on first and third and nobody out, and one with the bases filled and two out. He went after two bad pitches thrown by Ross. Want to know the count. Earl Weaver in the driver's seat right now with the Orioles up two games to one. Game five here tomorrow, and then Six and seven in Baltimore. One and one. 
And there's two pitches right there. Ott's been calling the fastball. You see him put down the one. He'll move to the outside thigh. That's what he's using. Now he's going to come with the fastball inside. Going to try and tie him up a little bit. Two and one account on Singleton. Curling foul back out of play. Two balls and two strikes. Here's the 2 2 pitch. Got him swinging. So Jim Bibby retires the Orioles 1 2 3. And at the end of the half inning, it's Baltimore nothing and the Pirates coming up. The Orioles defensively, Gary Renicki started last night's game in center, then moved over to left. He's back in left field today with Al Bunbury in center field. And around in right for the Orioles is Ken Singleton. The infield. Remaining the same with Doug DeSense stretching out his back muscles. Spent a lot of time on the disabled list early in the season with a back problem. Kiko Garcia, the shortstop. At second base, we saw Billy Smith in games one and two, and Rich Dower in games three and now four. And Eddie Murray, whom a lot of people think is the best defensive first baseman in the American League. Back of the plate is Dave Skaggs, who has become, in essence, Dennis Martinez's designated catcher. And Martinez on the mound. It's a situation that is relatively similar to what existed for years in Philadelphia and before that St. Louis with Tim McCarver always catching Steve Carlton, serving as Carlton's not only designated catcher, but designated ventriloquist from time to time. As you look at the <laughs> pirate lineup, Omar Marino in center, Foley in short, Parker, Stargell, Milner, Madlock, Ott, Garner, and Bibby. Steve's going to have to find a new designated ventriloquist next year because McCarver's retired. That's right. And it kind of reminds you of uh, the times, too, that Ryan and Tanana, they always like to have Terry Humphrey get. Sometimes pitchers just get into that little phase that they just feel comfortable with a catcher. And, of course, everybody in sports are all over. Maybe it's superstitious of some kind. Of course, ball players right at the pattern, top of that list. That pattern, Don, goes back a long way. From Homosassa Springs in Florida, the Dodgers had a great right hand named Dazzy Vance, and he would only pitch to a man named Hank DeBerry. Omar Marino to lead off, Tim Foley, Dave Parker to follow. Earl Weaver in talking about Skaggs and Martinez getting together, he says, well, you know, one thing it enables me to do also, it gives me a chance to give Dempsey one day off during the regular season. Certainly a five. factor. In a World Series, he doesn't play with designated catchers. <laughs> Rick had a long night last night. He's had a hard series, and he needed a day's rest. Omar Marino looks at a strike. Martinez starts off with a 92-mile-an-hour fastball. He can throw hard. He's got good stuff. Now watch this. Now he's going to go back to the fastball outside. Shook off the curve. One and one. Skaggs was a touch questioning on that call, wasn't he? Now? Martinez, a little question on that call, too. You could see him just kind of looking, uh, kind of raise an eyebrow. He's going to go back with a fastball away. The 1 1 to Marino is line foul. I thought it was interesting that the two fellas are together all the time as battery mates, and yet Martinez shakes Skaggs off on just the second pitch of the game. <laughs> well, the one thing about pitching and catching. The catcher suggests the sign, the pitcher okays it. If the catcher's going to call everything, why, that's going to make it tough because you just can't go out there and throw a pitch that you really don't have your heart in. So that's what you usually say. The catcher will suggest it, and the pitcher will go ahead and okay it. Now watch this curveball if it's good. Well, let me ask you something. If you have an all-time great catcher like Roy Campanella was, did you ever... Contravene, Roy? Every now and then, not too often when you're that young, when I first came up. You but wouldn't I would have go, the nerve. <laughs> well, no, because Jackie Robinson might come in and kick me right in the seat of the pants from third. <laughs> say you're taking too much time. Let's go. <laughs> two and two on Marino, who led the league in stolen bases this season. Bounce to the left of Garcia. Nice pickup by Kiko. Close play, but he gets him. One down. What speed Marino has, you know about that. About Garcia, he is not clearly the shortstop Belanger is, but his feeling has improved enormously because of Mark. Mark has worked with him on position play. 
That's Jim McKeon. Yeah, the, the American League umpires will do that in cold weather. They have the permission to do that, and can't say that's all bad. The third base umpire, Jerry Newdecker, the same. And down the right field line, that's last night's home plate umpire, Russ Getz. They all have the red gloves. Tim Foley takes inside, ball one. One and oh. Foley two for 13 in the series thus far. No score, bottom of the first inning. Base is empty, one out. One and one. You know, even though that Martinez had that second, you know, the second half of the year was bad, and Howard, I gotta believe, he's from, first of all, from Managua, Nicaragua, and I gotta believe that he had to have some family matters on the back of his mind, too. Took him a long time to get through to his family down there. And of course, they were going through the strife and everything down in that country. Jim Palmer, for one, has a theory that Dennis is going to handle of the Bucks today. Shot. Back of second. Garcia able to glove it, but his throw not in time. Pulling Murray off. And Tim Foley is aboard with an infield single. Do you realize how far Garcia went for that ball? That is amazing. And the play, well, it wasn't real close at first base, but he made that play a heck of a lot closer than what it might have been. Look where he goes. He's in shallow center field. He's now on the second base side of the bag. And now this throw, he gets a little something on it. You know, Foley's across the bag, but he still made it a fairly close play. Foley had to hustle. But the hit was a Foley kind of hit. The contact hitter who will find the holes. So Tim is at first base with one down and Dave Parker. Five hits in the series, four of them in game one off Mike Flanagan. Bounce back to Martinez. He goes to Garcia. Kiko makes a nice play to throw and get him on a double play. Kiko Garcia, first saving it from going into center field, able to make the force on Foley and then get it back to Murray. Boy, that's a good play, Al. Martinez took his time. Garcia came back to the bag. He held his glove out, said, let me have it right here. Now, all of a sudden, Martinez on the first base side on that slope, and look at the play that Garcia makes to double him up. Wasn't it lovely the way he laced that foot over the bag? We'll be back in a moment. There's another look at that double play that ended the first inning. You see the hands up. Garcia does not commit himself, and he's very fortunate for that. A good play, and then they double up Parker. So we go to the second inning in game number four. Middle of the order, Eddie Murray, Doug DeSensei, and Gary Renicky. Jim Bibby. After setting the Orioles down one, two, three in the first, starts Murray with a fastball low, ball one. One of the tough things about today, you've got the gray and white puffy clouds moving fast overhead. You've got patches of blue, bright sunshine coming through. And boy, that can make it tough on fly balls to the infield and the outfield. Fouled back on the count one and two. There it is, and that's what makes it tough. Right now the sun trying to peek back through, then it will cover up. And then bang, as the clouds move overhead rapidly, that sun pops out again as it is right now. Now you get a ball in the air, and it can be a little tough. You've got to be on your toes if you're playing that infield or the outfield, especially on the fly ball. Those clouds get together, and we'll get those snow flows. <laughs> That's right. That's what they're predicting. And down he goes. So that's three successive strikeouts for Bibby, who has set down the first four men he's faced. Now the pitch down just a little bit. And you see that breaking pitch, very quick breaking pitch. And Murray cannot make contact. Bibby right now, he'll go to the fastball, as I said before. It'll either ride, if he keeps it down, it'll sink. He has the curveball that we've seen, and there's a slider. Doug DeSensei hit a home run in the first inning of game one. And he's drawn a blank since. He's one for 12 in the series. One and no the count. Right now, it appears that Ed Ott is going to the sequence signs. Please don't go anything on the plane. Please. He said it without anybody on second base, just going to a straight one flash, two, or whatever it might be. Let's 
2 and 0 the count. Now that two reasons that come to my mind uh, they might be doing that. Number one it just gets a pitcher in the habit if somebody does get on second base that he's working with those signs all the time. Or number two they've got the TV set going in the clubhouse uh -huh. and they've heard us talking about uh -huh. it. <laughs> I tend to think it might be the latter. <laughs> 2 a hole pitch. Is low ball three, three. And it's interesting. Some hitters, though, even if they have a coach who can pick up signs or somebody can tell them what a pitch is, they don't want to know it anyway. No, they sure don't. And all it does is take one little mistake, and someone says, "Okay, we've got the sign. Here's the curveball," and you look for it, and all of a sudden you get a fastball up and in, and it's see you later. And a three-one pitch, ball four. So the Orioles have their first base runner. Well, you mentioned Ed Ott calling sequential signs now. Ott knows Bibby. I talked to him about Bib before the game. Eddie, tell me about Jim Bibby. What's he got to stop the birds? Well, Jim Bibby is an all-around pitcher now. He has excellent control of all of his pitches, and he changes speeds well. He's developed a, a change-up slider and a change-up uh, forkball, and he's more or less a control pitcher. He keeps his pitches down well, and he spots them. He comes in and out, and he really keeps you honest. If you look away, he's going to bust you inside and more or less move you off the plate so he can work back outside. And he's a control pitcher and a power pitcher, and he's just an all-around great pitcher this year. That's pretty nice. A control pitcher and a power pitcher. Change-up forkball. Hmm. Got a name for everything. Backup slider, change up for <laughs> <ball. laughs> 1 0 on Renicky. The Sensi at first base and one away. <laughs> 1 and 1. Used to be a lot easier. They'd call the screwball the fade away in Christy Matheson's time. And then, of course, there was the drop. Remember the drop? That's right. The 3 1 pitch taken for a strike to the count full on Renicky at 3 and 2. That was the National League strike for sure. Yep. Renicky very much perturbed about the call. Look at it. Well, we said the other night the strike zone, first of all, you've got to throw it over the plate. It's from the armpits to the top of the knees. And that appeared that it was right at the top of the knees. 3 and 2 with the sensei at first base and one down. The Sensei goes. The pitch is swung on and missed. Oxrow is high, and the Sensei is in there. So the Sensei got a good jump, breaking on the 3 2 pitch. Renicky striking out. That's four strikeouts for Bibby as the Sensei steals second. Well, you can get a good jump on Bibby. He's got the high leg kick. The pitch is swung through. The throw by out, of course, a little bit high, but I believe the Sensei had the base stolen anyway. Luckily, Doug didn't get hurt on this. He could have got hurt pretty good. There's two gamers right there that are tangled up. I'll tell you that. Garner and DeSensei, they come to play. Dower at the plate. Rich led the club during the regular season in game-winning hits with 14. <laughs> oh, and one to count. He is firing. Four strikeouts as Don told you. Renicky in there in place of Lowenstein. He's really perspiring. Oh, he does. Cold. I'll tell you, you'll see. You might see some icicles out there as this game goes <laughs> on. Lowenstein has not been hitting well since he hurt his ankle. He needed this day. Oh, and to the count. He blew that one Ooh. by him. 94 miles per hour on that pitch. Jim Bibby warming to the task. Reminds me a lot of Don Newcomb. Don used to Doesn't perspire he? so much. And that drip off the bill of that cap. Not only that, similar physical structure. You're both big guys, you're right. Oh, and to the count. One and two. It was interesting. Bibby worked up a pretty good lather in the playoffs in game number two on a cool night in Cincinnati. Didn't take him any time at all. Uh, he's all the way through the bill of that cap Oof. right now. He would melt away if it was 65 degrees. <laughs> One and two. Two down. The Sensei at second. Oh. 
popped up. Garner will take care of it. And that's after Baltimore in the second. No runs, no hits, leave one in the middle of the second inning. The Orioles nothing, and the Pirates nothing in game four. The preceding was a message on behalf of Major League Baseball. Willie Stargell to lead off, and John Milner and Bill Madlock. The four, five, and six hitters in the bottom of the second inning. No score. Wilbur Dornell Stargell. Born in Oklahoma, grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Living now in Pittsburgh. Big part of the community. Physically and spiritually. 1 0. Out here, Captain. That's what that sign says. As we've said, he can hit it anyway. Fouled away. And the count is 1 and 1. Dennis Martinez. Martinez. Had an up and down year. You take a look at the schedule for the next couple of games. Game five tomorrow, four o'clock Eastern time, and game six if necessary, assuming the Pirates win one of the next two on Tuesday night at eight. Martinez got off to a good start and really struggled coming down the stretch. He finished with the only losing record on the Orioles staff at 15 and 16, and the only reason he is even starting in the World Series is because of the rain out that took away the off day. Martinez is a real high kick pitcher. This can become significant because the Bucks, if they get on, those who move fastest should really take advantage of that. Well, they can. Both pitchers you can run on. You can run on Martinez and you can run on Bibby Bo. People have heard us talking about miles per hour with that jugs gun. And we'll get into that pretty soon, just right after this pitch, maybe, because Weaver's a great believer in that. Right behind home plate, they have a member. Of... Here comes the high kick. See that? The key to Martinez that Miller has, he tells him to keep that left arm inside that knee. When he gets outside, he pulls himself out a lot. Stargell fouls it back into the upper deck. But I was talking about Earl Weaver. Now, Earl Weaver will go with that jugs gun. He believes in that. Right behind home plate, they have a member of the Baltimore staff sitting with a jugs gun and the walkie-talkie, and he will relay the times of that particular pitch. <laughs> he was shaking his head at you. Yes, no, he no, Earl. You no, do no, too. Don, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but they do. They keep that, and they tell if a pitcher's losing velocity off this fastball. Right there, there's the gentleman. There's the jugs gun. Now he'll. Now that would have been a National League strike. I was watching the jugs gun. <laughs> <laughs> they never had that in your day. No, you're right. Two oh. balls, two strikes again on Stargell. <laughs> really leading off in the bottom of the second, no score. Hit in the air to deep center field. Bunbury going back, all the way back at the fence. Gone. He can hit it out anywhere. So the great man comes through and gives the Bucks an early lead. His second home run of the World Series. Dead center field, about 410 feet on the fly. Well, he starts with a home run in game one and then back with one in game four. Well, he got it all. He got it up high. There's a little breeze swirling around, checking the flag. It is blowing a little bit towards center. Bunbury thought he might have a play on it, but it just got over. That's good enough. Well, it goes over one foot or two feet. They call him back out. So 
Boy, they love him here, don't they? Yeah, it's an amazing thing to see. An athlete capture the hearts of a population the way that man does. And seldom has Pops, Willie Stargell, let his people down. In the second against Dennis Martinez, Stargell demonstrates his paternal power. Willie Stargell would be worth his weight in Pirate Stars just for the spiritual lift he gives his team. Add 32 homers, his clutch hitting in the pennant stretch and playoff. And it's easy to see why he's the focal point of this World Series. He's one player, they're never going to boo. Yep, one and oh. You know what's amazing about it is John Miller stands in, he hits one about 410 feet. Goes back in and just picks up a cup of coffee and has yep. a sip and says, okay, let's go. There's your run. <laughs> <laughs> Low ball two. Two and out of count. I mean, he hit it. That was a monstrous blow. Hit on the ground and in the right field for a base hit. So John Milner collects the third hit off Martinez here in the second inning. After Stargell leads off with a home run, Milner is aboard with nobody out. And up comes Bill Madlock. And the place rocking now. <clears throat> You'll get these people right now. They will be rocking. A lot of black and yellow pom-poms being waved. Madlock with three hits in the series. First base, one to nothing Pirates in the bottom of the second. Madlock fits right in with these guys. He sure does. Bill unhappy in San Francisco. Didn't make any secret of that as Milner goes and Madlock drills it into the corner there and then bouncing into the bullpen for a ground rule double that might have cost him a run because Milner was running on the pitch. Well, it saved him a run for sure. We don't know what the outcome of the inning will be, but with Milner running, Madlock hooks it down the line, and right there to make the call is the left field umpire, Bob Engel. And, and Martinez was still in his kick, and Milner was halfway down the line and more. You see, it just takes that big high hop and over the fence, and it stayed in the playing field. Uh, the Pirates would have had a run for sure. The pitching coach, Ray Miller, coming out to try to settle Martinez down. Well, you'll see a lot of times the pitching coaches will come out the first time nowadays because they're the ones that work with these guys day in and day out. And the big thing right there is you see Ray Miller go back to the Baltimore dugout. Here's what's coming up immediately following today's game, Oklahoma and Texas. But they will talk to him. And just if they're doing something that they might see from the dugout, as I said, they work with them all the time, and they can go out and they can relate to it. Ed Ott coming up with runners at second and third, and nobody out. Ott a starter in game two. One for three in the series. The Oriole infield is back. So a ground ball could score Milner from third. Milner at third, and Madlock at second. Time called. Well, the one thing for sure that we know after today's game, Chuck Tanner is going to name his pitcher for tomorrow. He has not made that decision yet, but looking at the Pirate bullpen, we know it's not going to be Bly Levin because he's warming up. He's getting ready for the next day, I think. There's Burt. Martinez appears unsettled with the National League umpire. Hot. Hits it to deep center field. Bunbury was playing shallow, and it's over his head, and that's a ground rule double. Two runs in, it's 3 nothing. I thought he hit a home run. <laughs> he's coming home, but he's going to go back to second. <laughs> there, he touched his own plate, and he's going to circle him again. <laughs> 
Lee, this is so typical of the Bucks. Always bouncing back, battling back. So the left-handed hitters are shelling Martinez. John Milner singles. And Bill Madlock, who's found a home in Pittsburgh, wraps a ground rule double into the bullpen. Now there's runners at second and third. Catcher Ed Ott is next. And he proves one good ground rule double deserves another. Two runs come home, and Three Rivers roars on. Still nobody out in the inning. It's 3-0 Pirates, and Garner is at the plate. Phil is 5 for 10 in the series. Lined in the center field for a base hit. Hot around third, and after hesitating, he's caught in a rundown. As Skagg starts to move him back toward third, and the tag is made by Desenze. That ball was almost thrown away by Skaggs. It was thrown high. But the sensei, a tall man, was able to corral it and make the tag. What they almost made the play, and it was almost fouled up, and that was by Eddie Murray. Because here's the throw. They're letting it come, and now that ball is deflected. And see, it comes up the line. But Ott is a dead duck as he comes around. He realizes he's caught. He's just trying to give Garner a chance to go to second base. He does throw. So. There's Ott again coming around. Joe Lynette waving him all the way. Now he starts to stop. <laughs> and I start to stop again. He says, I shouldn't even be here. <laughs> of course, this was the controversial play in the ninth inning of the second game. Murray affecting a cutoff. Here he deflected the ball. Ott the runner coming in to score the winning run. We'll be back in a moment. Well, we are finally going to take a look at Sammy Stewart, who last pitched on the 29th of September, but was up and throwing in the bullpen seemingly every 15 minutes during the playoffs and thus far in the World Series. Likewise, he comes in with one out in the bottom of the second inning. It's 3-0 Pittsburgh. Stewart, hard thrower. Sammy should be up 92, 93, 94 miles an hour. 6-3, 210-pounder. One and oh the count. That was a big mistake Ott made in that base running. Really was. You don't want to cut off what could be a tremendous inning. Now the thing is, there's still three runs on the board with six hits. And you now have one out. Line back to the pitcher, Stewart, and then Sammy throws it into center field. Garner, after falling down, gets up and holds on as the throw comes into the sensei. Boy, there's a heads-up play by Bumbry because it looks like it looked to me like Stewart all of a sudden he threw a double. <laughs> but Bumbry got over there in a hurry and he cut it off. You know, looking at it again. There it is one more time. Garcia going back over there. They might have had it. It would have been a close play, but now he throws it behind Garner. And here's a heads-up play by Bumber. He is there backing up. He's, everything is in front of him, and he's where he should be. Going back to the play on Ott, the other night in that ninth inning when he scored the winning run, he went through the sign, and he talked to me about that. And he went through the sign in this inning, too, or so it appeared to me. Well, sometimes he was out it a long goes ways. for you, and sometimes it doesn't. Omar Marino grounded out in the first. That's line in the center field. Being waved in. Garner rounding third. And the Bucks lead it 4-0. If Bumbry would have known what was happening to Garner, he'd have made a play at the plate. But Al did not know what was happening because Garner was stumbling and almost went down coming around third. He charges the ball well. You see him timing himself to get into position to throw. Now, if he'd have let it go, 
He might have had a shot because Garner, as he was stumbling coming around, he just decides, well, now it's too late. Now that I've seen what's happened, I can't get him. So four runs over in the inning, and there he is. There's Garner stumbling round third. As Don just mentioned, and Bumbry concentrating on picking the ball up, and by the time he realized what had happened, too late. Tim Foley, the eighth man to come up in the inning. One for one today, an infield single. Stewart with a good move, and he's got him. So Marino at first base with two down in a situation where he might be going, and he gets picked off. So an inglorious end to the inning for the Bucks, but they come up with four. It's a good move, too, and they've got him dead to rights, and Jim McKeon, the first base umpire, is right there on the call. Four runs, six hits in the inning, and at the end of two in game four, it's Pittsburgh four, Baltimore nothing. Well, number eight has been number one in Pittsburgh for a long time. He's the man who got the inning started with a home run. As we mentioned before, it's interesting because were this the regular season, Willie would be off today. Tanner would sit him down and rest him after a night game, especially one that lasts until 12.30 something in the morning, as was the case last night. But Willie in the lineup today, and the home run got the Bucks moving in the bottom of the second. Yes, but we still haven't had a really well-played game in this series. In that inning, the Birds got one buck out, and the Bucks took two of themselves out. That's exactly right. Nothing but mistakes. Dave Skaggs, he's heading for the first time in the series, and time called again. We've got hot dog wrappers and other paper blowing. The Pittsburgh Panthers played here at 10 o'clock in the morning. Not on this field, of course, but they beat the Cincinnati Bearcats 35 to nothing. You were over there early, weren't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Al was over there. <laughs> sure. He came here, and tonight he's going to the hockey game. <laughs> 0-2 pitch. Bounced. It takes a wicked hop, and Madlock able to stay with it, but Strigel can't dig it out. So the ball looked like it might have hit the seam where the dirt meets the turf at third. Madlock eaten up by it, and Skaggs is aboard at first base. Now that ball was exactly just about what you said, Al. It was, it was a pretty good. It was just a routine ground ball, but then all of a sudden it hits right. Well, it comes up on the dirt, and then it comes up on Madlock. And now his throw is offline. Stargell has no chance. He just takes a big swipe at it. And you've got the heads up second baseman Phil Garner right in behind him to back it up. We said we have not had a really well played game yet. I haven't made a judgment or a call on that yet. Now this is an interesting thing. Weaver is letting Sammy Stewart back. You know you don't question quote the greatest manager in baseball quote. Stewart. At least it's not the disposition of many to question Earl because he won 102 games and almost by consensus there's no better manager. He just has faith in his team's ability to scratch back. Well I thought that they'd put him up there and have him bunt. And you're just gambling that he might pick up a run with Bumbry and Garcia following but there was no attempt to bunt right there. It's a ground ball and a double play and then you kind of scratch your head a little bit. Oh, and two. Meanwhile, they've scored the bouncer by Skaggs, an error on Madlock. Which it should have been. You talk to Bill tomorrow. <laughs> oh, two pitch. Got him swinging. Blew it by him. Five strikeouts for Bibby. That one, 94 miles an hour. Center failure. So Bibby, working with a four-run cushion, has struck out five of the first nine men he's faced, and now Bumbry comes up, bounced out in the first inning. Let me explain why I think Don Earl did not bat for Stewart. He said, if I made a mistake in the second game when I talked to him about not running Lowenstein, it's that I used up my pinch hitters too early in the game, referring to people like Kelly and Crowley. 
And maybe that's his thinking here. We'll find a way to pick back a run or two, and then later in the game, when I need these guys, I'll have them to call them. All right, I can see that. I'll go, but you just gave him an out there by letting him hit. Why not bunt? That I agree with. One and zero the count, and it's one and one on Bunbury. See the papers blowing around now. The wind really swirling. Two two pitch, bounced up the middle and into center field for a base hit. That's the first Oriole hit. As Skagg stops at second. Al, that's just what Don Drysdale was talking about. Had he bunted the pitcher when they elected to let bat, that hit would have scored a run, and they would have scratched back one. Kiko Garcia outside, ball one. Garcia struck out in the first. Those clouds are now coming together. They are coming together, and I know that Chuck Tanner sitting there hoping they want to get five in for sure and still be on top. And the temperature is dropping. Foul back. One and one. The cloud covered. Started out, it was a very sunny and clear morning. And scattered clouds moving into the area. And now pretty good cloud cover. Forecast for snow flurries. We've seen those before. <laughs> yeah, that's nothing new. <laughs> 14, 15 hours ago. <laughs> Hit to deep left center field. John Milner racing back, <laughs> and that one bounces up against the fence. Skaggs coming in to score. Bumbry coming in to score. And Garcia, last night's big man, picks up a two-run double to make it 4-2. What we've talked about, the unexpected heroes. This kid has rocketed international attention. His four hits last night, the four ribbies, the base clearing triple, now two more ribbies. Well, he got behind the count three and one, and he got the fastball up over the plate, and Garcia is looking nothing but fastball. He got it, got out in front, timed it well, and hit the ball well. Well, I've decided that maybe Tommy Lasorda is right. Weaver walks with angels. <laughs> Dead Singleton hits it foul, 0 and 1. So they're back in the ball game, and we've got another of these head-to-head -head battles between two teams that seem so evenly matched. That's hit deep to left center field. Moreno is racing back, and that one hits the bottom of the fence as Garcia rounds third. He'll come in to score. The throw to second is not in time, and it's four to three. Now that's the Kenny Singleton we've grown accustomed to throughout the season. So they are teeing off on Bibby here in the third. And he gets a fastball out away from him. And Kenny, we've said before, has got terrific power to the opposite field. He hits that ball well up the gap. No chance whatsoever to run it down. It short hops off the wall. Right there to make the play is Moreno. A close play at second base. As Garcia scores, it's 4-3 to three Pittsburgh. There's a play at second base. He makes a good, strong throw. Singleton has to hustle all the way. So the tying run at second base, still only one out of the inning, and Eddie Murray struck out in the second. Half swing. They, they can appeal, appeal it. Appeal. I don't think they it'll call get it. He got a strike. He got a strike out. Yes, sir. Jerry right. Newdecker, the American League umpire at third base, made the call. There it is. Yes, he did. You think he did? I think he did. You're Matter of fact, I can look at the scoreboard and tell you he did. <laughs> <laughs> Ran it in on him. One and two. There's a good pitch by Bibby right there. And down goes Murray. So Eddie strikes out for the second time. Bibby has struck out six. Good slider. And Murray just got a time pretty good. He just swings over the top of it. With two down, Doug DeSensei threw a walk in the second inning. 
You know Howard what you said before seems even bigger and bigger right now with this four to three Pittsburgh score and lead with the Pirates running themselves into two outs and Baltimore only getting one out which could have been a very big second inning for Pittsburgh. That's right. That's why those plays are so important. They add up the accumulation of uncapitalized upon opportunity can kill you. It's the same in every sport. In football, it's turnovers, mistakes. In baseball, it's the same thing. This is one of the reasons why your old team, the Dodgers, have always excelled. Because they so stress the fundamentals, they don't make the mistakes. Hit in the air, left field, shallow, Foley out, and Milner coming in, and Milner makes a catch. But in the inning, the Orioles get right back in it. Three runs, three hits. A big error by Madlock. Middle of the third, 4-3, Pirates. Tim Foley in a new uniform in a new city enjoyed his best season. In 1979, he'll lead off, and earlier, Howard chatted with him. Well, with the season you've had, you were finally properly rewarded a five-year contract. Well, it's a great feeling, you know. I have that security for my family. You know, there's a, a lot of priorities in my life now. My family's one of them, my future's one of them, and, and now I've got that secured. So I feel real good about that five-year contract. With the situation I'm in, uh, in, in back of Omar Marino and in front of Dave Parker, uh, it's fun for me. Anybody in my situation who hits the ball like I do, just sprays the ball around and, and just tries to make contact, uh, it's the ideal situation, and, and I'm glad to be here, and I hope that uh, everybody stays healthy for about five years and we can win. Tim Foley leading off in the bottom of the third inning. What he said, interesting. He's wedged in there between Marino and Parker, and what a difference that's made. One and one. Tim with the Mets in Montreal and San Francisco. Gets wedged into the middle of this lineup, and he's blossomed this year. Found away. And the Pirates are happy that they have him to put in that wedge. I'll guarantee you that. Look at that. You know, Foley is the first player in 50 years to have aired in the first three games of the series. He fights it off and bounces it down toward third and essentially has no play. You can hardly get one in on Tim's hands because his hands are up by the label. <laughs> well, that's, that one off his thumb. That ball rolling down the line, and it's just hugging the line all the way. Desensei coming on and realizing that he has to try and make the barehanded play or just get it and throw off balance, but then he can't find the handle. He gets the ball, and then after that, it just pops right out of his hand. I don't believe he's going to get Foley anyway. No, he wouldn't have gotten him anyway, and again, Foley, the contact hitter. So hard to strike out. Now, if you want to know why he talked about being behind Marino and ahead of Parker, well, Marino gets on base, the pitcher throws fastballs, and Foley is a fastball hitter. So it's helped him enormously in his season-long batting. Oh, that's so true. You get any man that can handle the bat a little bit, and you get a man that's in front of you with any speed that has any consistency of getting on base, and boy, I'll tell you, that is... That is just the ideal position to be in. The 2-2. Hit the center. Bumbry is right there. One out. Starter day. Eh? The way the Bucks have been hitting out toward those walls, they'll put them in to get the rebounds. <laughs> Penn State, 7 to nothing over Army. The Mountaineers, 7 to nothing over Boston College. And William and Mary, 7 to nothing over the United States Naval Academy. Army, an improved football team. Lou Saban putting together the nucleus of something. Beat Stanford a couple of weeks ago. Which is not easy. Willie Stargell looks at a strike. 410 foot homer in the second inning. There was a good curve ball right there. Another 0 and 2. Lord, that started as I looked to the bullpen as a huge man. And there was a man that was released by the White Sox. 
Baltimore picked him up. He was not released by North Carolina State, however, where he was a great <laughs> basketball player. Hit there, down into the right field corner. Foley headed toward third as Ken Singleton plays it in the corner, and they will hold Foley at third on a double by Stargell. Can you imagine how Stargell can be looking for that pitch in there after looking the way he did at two curveball? And he got a fastball in a pretty good location, and Stargell just hooked it inside the bag. He will do that to you. The senior citizen, he calls himself, 38 years of age. And all of the snap and crispness in that bat has remained intact through the years. Well, time's going to be called. Ray Miller going to go out, and he's going to talk to Sammy Stewart a little bit. Miller, the hitter, you've got first base open, and Madlock coming up behind him, a right-hand hitter. And they will walk Miller and work on Madlock. Well, that's about it. They'll go with the percentages, right-hander to right-hander. You have to do it, but certainly you have trepidation in doing it because Matlock is a far better hitter than Milner. Bounce down to second. Great play by Dower to Garcia. One back to first. They get the double play. So the strategy worked. Yes, it did. They made it work. Good play by the second baseman. What a play by Dower because that ball, he kicked back on him after it hit the dirt. We'll take a look at it again as Madlock hits it hard by Stewart. Now Dower going over, and now it takes a skip back on him. You see, he almost overran the ball. Then he comes up. The ball was hit so hard. All he's got to do is make the routine play after that, and there's the little ball beats runner. He's out there because I don't think he touched second base. <laughs> so they come up empty in the third. We go to the fourth. It's still 4-3 Pittsburgh. Gary Renicky leads off in the fourth inning. He'll be followed by Dower and Skaggs. Four, three Pirates as we start the fourth inning. And the first pitch is inside ball one. Here's another one of those in the neighborhood double plays that ended the bottom of the third inning. The great play by Dower. And then Garcia questionable as to whether he touched second or not. One and one at the time of play in which the umpire almost invariably calls him out. Here it is again. Now the throw is right there, as I said before. Ball beats runner, runner out. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean in the neighborhood? <laughs> Again, he laced the bag with his glove. I don't believe he did. No. Pitch sharply, great stop by Madlock, who gets up and guns him down. So the man who made the key error that got things started for the Orioles in the third makes a sparkling play to Rob Renicky here in the fourth. Well, he took away a double right there. There's Madlock, crack of the bat, he goes over, and now there it is. He's got it already. That ball was hit hard. He saved a double. There's another look at it from another angle. To the backhand, and he saved a double. Tell you the history of... As Dower singles into left field with one out. Now you can see how big that was. Now you've got a tie ball game if Matlock didn't come up That's with it. Right. Robinson working again in the bullpen. I mean Roberts. This time not Robinson. Roberts, the bearded, the veteran who's been so much travel. Let me tell you something, John. That's your Dave Scott. Gotta be some luck to having the right guy in the right spot. Some luck all the time. Well, they threw Weaver in the Boston and the Charles River had come up the other side with a fruit stand. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Skaggs uh, inside uh, one. <laughs> oh, I don't believe you. <laughs> Grounded toward the hole. Foley goes to Garner one. The first turns it over for two. What a turnover oh. at second and what a good play by Foley. That was a tough play. I didn't think they had a chance in the world. Now watch Timmy. As he goes to the hole, and as he throws, he just gets himself in position while he's off the ground. And Garner able to turn it over for two. So in the middle of the fourth inning, 4-3 four, Pittsburgh. 
Al Michaels, Howard Cosell, Don Drysdale. Well, has it been eight years already? The first World Series night game played right here in the 71 series. That was the year they played one game at night to experiment. The following year, they went to three games at night. And in this series, five of the contests scheduled at night. Tomorrow, a day game, a late afternoon game. We'll be on the air at 4 Eastern. Yeah, that's one of the... Uh, I think that's really worked out well, Al. It's given so many people a chance across the country to watch the World Series that otherwise might have missed it during the daytime when they're working. Exactly. Instead of sneaking in the transistors to work or school. That's right. Sit back and relax. Exactly why newspapers are put out in the morning. Reach the most number of readers. Three two pitch is lined to left field. Renicky going back and has a play on it, and makes the catch. You know, Howard, you talk about the fact we've seen a lot of shoddy fielding in this series, a lot of errors. It's been interesting though. We've seen some great plays. Yes, there, there have been flashes of defensive brilliance, no question about it. That Ott is a deceiving hitter. He's the guy Bumbrey played too shallow. He gets a lot of wood into the ball. Said to me today. What do you mean, tree trunk? <laughs> I said, well, it, it's an attempt to describe the stocky nature of your body. <laughs> Gardner bluffing a butt. And the count is 0-1. Well, that's the man who held together so well for the Bucks. He'll pitch Tuesday night, if necessary. One and one. Lila. Interesting to see who Tanner comes back with tomorrow. Chuck is as yet undecided. He started Bruce Keeson in I game gotta, one. I got to guess Keeson now. Yeah, I don't see so. him else. One and two the count. He's not as deep in starting pitchers, as quality starting pitchers, as is Weaver. Grounded into the hole and through for a base hit. So Grinder is two for two, and in the series now, Phil has seven hits in 12 trips to the plate. Bucks win the series. Despite his defensive lapses, he can wind up the hero. Hey, look at that. Georgia tied with LSU, which gave USC such a tremendous tussle, and Georgia's lost three, tied at the half. Johnny Majors and his volunteers in a tie with Georgia Tech. Maryland and the Wolfpack tied in the third period. And Wake Forest leading North Carolina. And Wake Forest can do it to anybody. Alabama, the Crimson tied under the Big Bear, rolling 14-0 over Florida. 12-0 in the second period. Ohio State over Indiana. Jim Bibby lined out in the second inning. Bounce sharply back to the pitcher who goes to second, and oh, look at that takeout, but he's out. <laughs> Kingo Garcia. <laughs> Did you see Garner? He gives nothing away. Looking at the umpire, waiting to see if he would call him out. Well, the throw was right there. Garcia just was trying to make the catch and then try to get out of the way. And Garner taking him out all the way. So they can double up Bibby at first base. Good heads up play by Garner. Earl Weaver wants to talk, I believe, to the second base umpire, Paul Rungi, about exactly where Garner was when he went in. But he's all right. He slid a little late. But Garcia was standing right there. He's also out there to check, check on the his physical condition. That's right. But uh, Earl goes out very pointedly, as we have told you, to make a show and establish position with the umpire. Try and have an edge on the next call. Tippy Martinez. You know what I love about Weaver is that he's so upfront. He very rarely mentions words. What was it, about three or four years ago, Mike Cuellar? Toward the end of his career at Baltimore, he was upset because he wasn't getting a chance to pitch very much and said so, and it was written. And Weaver said, what is he talking about? He said, I've given him more chances than I gave my first wife. <laughs> 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 <laughs 
Well, the thing is, you've got to stay within the length of your body from the bag, and that's certainly what Phil Garner does. He goes right over the bag with that right foot. All he does is take about a 91-foot slide. But you can't go out of the to the right or to the left. If you go out too far and away from the length of your body, they'll call you out. They'll call it a double play. They have put that rule in effect to protect the shortstop or the second baseman. Especially the second baseman can really get whacked if he gets from the blind side, if you can run all over that base path out there. Omar Marino at the plate, 1-0 and with two down and Bibby at first base. Ball two. Two and over. Still in the fourth inning now. And the Bucks, there you see it, have ten hits, but only four runs. And three and two thirds innings. That second inning still might loom to be a very, very big inning. They gave away two outs themselves. 2-0 pitch is bounced toward the middle, fielded by Garcia. Makes the unassisted force, and the fourth inning is over. No runs a hit, leave one. Into four, still 4-3, four, Pittsburgh. Fifth inning, it's 4-3, Pirates. Lee May will pinch it to lead things off as you look at the schedule tomorrow at 4 o'clock Eastern, if necessary, back to Baltimore on Tuesday at 8 o'clock. Fifth inning, and with more play-by-play, -play, Don Drysdale. All right, Al, it will be Lee May. Then we go to the top of the order, and Kiko Garcia in that order. Bibby already, through four innings, has thrown 75 pitches. Uh, he's got his exercise in for the afternoon, to say the least. May on the year hit 254, 19 home runs, 69 RBIs. Veteran right hand hitter. Good breaking pitch. Lee May has hit Bibby. 409. You see it right there. 9 for 22. I don't care how many pitches Bibby has thrown down. His history is he gets stronger. Another swing and a miss at a breaking pitch. 0-2. Your history is you come on and the teams get runs. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm up here. <laughs> Two strikes to Lee May. <laughs> Backs him off the plate. Got him on a good fastball. Now strikeout number seven for Bibby. Jim throwing hard at the outset. He was blocked in the mid-90s in the first inning and still throwing hard. And Lee May, a pretty good fastball hitter, gets blown away on a fastball that was just timed at 95. Now here's Al Bumbry, one for two this afternoon. He bounced a second, and he singled and scored in the third. Down the left field line, Johnny Milner right there. And now look at the breeze pick up. It really did. It gave Milner all kinds of trouble as suddenly he was back pedaling in the manner of a linebacker. Now there's two gone and we go to Kiko Garcia. This telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and is intended solely for the private non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of Major League Baseball is prohibited. Here's Garcia. A key double in the third to drive in two. He struck out his first time at bat, one for two. Hit well to center field. Moreno giving ground, but has the play. And that is out number three. So Baltimore is gone one, two, three in the fifth. And after four and a half, it remains four to three, Pittsburgh. A special Sunday edition of NFL football. Pat Hayden steers the LA Rams against Starbuck, Dorsett, and the Dallas Cowboys tomorrow night on ABC. Steve Stone is the new Baltimore pitcher. There's his numbers on the year. 111 lost seven. Earned run average of 3.77, making his first World Series appearance. Steve joined Baltimore after winning 27 games for the White Sox the last couple of years. That's how the Pirates scored in the second inning. Stargell led off with a home run to straightaway center field. Milner singled, Matlock doubled, Ott doubled the drive in two. Then Garner singled, and Ott was thrown out at the plate. Garner going to second on the play, then Moreno single, scoring Garner. Interesting, isn't it, that Moreno, who got off to such a terrible start in this series, now today provided the hit that constitutes the lead run. Stone has...
has a fastball that will run on you as you look at Tim Foley, who will lead it off for Pittsburgh in the fifth inning. It'll be Foley, Parker, and Stargell, the first three to face Stone. Tim is two for two this afternoon. Both infield singles. This game is still tied because of a brilliant play by Matlock on a grounded deep behind third that looked like a down the line double for DeSensei. Matlock converted it into an out. Stone the fastball that will tail on you, and he's got the curveball. So a subsequent single by Renneke went for naught. This has been in the pattern of this series, this game. Two balls and no strikes to Foley. Here's the guy you want to keep off base. You see Skaggs looking over to the right, just reminding himself who's in the on-deck circle. You <laughs> can't miss him because he's a big one. Dave Parker. Hear the chant in the background, Foley, Foley, Foley. Foley Spines. This is a bad time to put Mr. Foley on. Good pitch. And Foley takes a count three and two. You see Timmy taking all the way. He's looking for one thing, and that's to be a base runner when he got the three ball count. And he walks he it. Did it. Foley's aboard. Parker's a hitter. And prior to the game, Howard had a chance to talk today. See a team more confident than this team that you're a part of? <laughs> I tell you, it's, it's been that way uh, ever since I've been in the Pirate organization. But we uh, we're so you know deep in talent that it's it's just unreal. This is the best club I've ever been on. Uh, of course, the positive attitude plays a big part in it, and also the fact that we uh, look at each other as being brothers more or less than just uh, players or uh, fellow. Uh, teammates, uh, we look at ourselves as being a part of each other. We're generally concerned with the, the other players' welfare, his family's welfare, and it's a family first. And then I think uh, along with the family comes winning. That's line to left, and Renicky's got to play it on a long hop. Foley stops at second base, and the Bucks have got something going here in the fifth. And look who's coming up. And the fans on their feet, waving their pom-poms, their yellow hankies, whatever they have, their pennants. Just look at all of them, ladies and gentlemen. We talked about these two cities, the teams, what they've meant to the cities. We did that yesterday. The family, that's what the legend says on top of the Pirates' dugout. And somehow or other, they're all family here in Three Rivers Stadium as they have been all year long. And here are the Bucks on top by one, threatening to get more. As Stargell just leans away from the fastball, looking in. And we get action again in the ball, the more bullpen. Stargell two for two, a home run and a double. They wheel, but no throw. Nobody's at the bag. There's the bullpen. Stoddard, the right-hander. Martinez, the left-hander. Jandy. And it'll be DeSensei to make the catch. They call the infield fly. Now there's one away. And it'll be Johnny Miller. And you look at it again. We've seen this happen quite often in the series. The bat just shattering. Breaking apart. And as Don mentioned, the infield fly rule in effect, even though it was a soft looper, the hand going up from Jerry Newdecker, the umpire at third, Stargell automatically out. Didn't you think he was trying to hit inside out? I think he was just trying to get some good wood on it. The way he took the swing, that's the way they approached the ball, Howard, and that's the way he got Walker it. Walker went inside out. Yes, he did. Here's Milner. He has singled and scored in the second inning. He was walked intentionally in the third, and that was to load the bases. And Baltimore got out of it when Matlock it into a double play.
Hit hard. Fair ball down the line. That'll score one and maybe two. That's what I mean about Milner. Parker to third. He holds Milner at second, and it's 5-3 Pittsburgh on the run-producing double by Johnny Milner. Now let's look at that Milner swing. Yep, they used to call Johnny over at Shea the Hammer when he was with the Mets. He's a quiet man. Look at it again. Has a fine level swing with those wrists. Here comes Earl Weaver out as you look at the remainder of that play. Weaver out to the mound. Steve Stone did it to himself. And he led off the inning walking Tim Foley. It appears see Weaver holding up those two fingers like that. They're liable to walk uh, Bill Madlock. We'll have to wait and see. Maybe not. A little chilly, Errol. Not just in the dugout. There's that heat pack. Now they will walk him. They won't even give him a chance to hit 3-0. and oh. And here comes, I'm sure, Martinez. Earl Weaver, the two fingers, and they will play for the double play. Nope. He'll fool you every time. Well, I saw before when he held those two fingers up, I had an idea that that's what he had in the back of his mind. They were going to maybe try just to pitch Madlock carefully. Well, they just decided to put him on. Here's out one for two, a long double. To left field, renicky has got a good arm. Parker tagging. He bluffs coming, and Renicky guns it to DeCense, and Parker, with good judgment, stays at third. And here is the kid who is 7 for 12 in this World Series. The leading hitter, Phil Garner. Garner, two for two this afternoon. And he scored a run. That was in the second inning. The bases remain loaded, but now there's two out. Well, the Orioles, one out from getting out of a tough jam here in the fifth inning. They've given up a run. The Pirates lead it five to three. Hard to Garcia. He goes the short way. They get the force, and the side is retired. But the Bucks pick up a run and lead five to three. And we'll be back with more baseball after this word from our local stations. Now Kenny Singleton will lead it off for Baltimore in the sixth inning. Howard had a chance to talk with Ken Pryor, and let's listen to their conversation. What gives you the edge, your team? I think uh, it's going to uh, boil down to the teams are very evenly matched. I will say this. Uh, I think that maybe overall we have more of a power hitting team than the Pirates. I think more than Parker, more than Stargell, more than Milner, more than Bill Robinson. More than even Little Garner, and how about Matlock? You've got more power than that. I think we we do. I think we've hit 181 home runs this year in a relatively tough ballpark to hit home runs in. Baltimore is not the easiest park to hit homers in. Uh, we do have the, basically Pirates' power is left-handed, and if you go with Stargell and Parker, two of their greater home run hitters, and we have we can compensate with that. We we'll go with uh, Flanagan and McGregor, two fine left-handers. Uh, the words of Kenny Singleton as he leads off the sixth inning for Baltimore. It'll be Singleton Murray DeSense to face Bibby, who has been on that bench. His last inning for Pittsburgh was 17 minutes. Now, the last time that happened, he had a long inning when they scored four in the second inning. Baltimore came back and scored three. Bibby has thrown 88 pitches thus far. Kenny Singleton's lady. Singleton this afternoon has struck out double and has driven in a run. Up the alley in right center, Moreno over to cut it off. So Singleton picks up his second hit of the afternoon, a leadoff single here in the sixth inning. And that will bring on Eddie Murray. Singleton 35 home runs on the year. Murray 25. Baseman, Kenny is Eddie now Murray. 6 for 15 in the series. 
Murray fanned twice. Came into the series four for nine. He's now four for 11. Garner, he goes to Foley for one. To Stargell, the double play. Eddie Murray started the series with a bang, but all of a sudden he has struck out twice today. And after Singleton with a leadoff single here in the sixth inning, it's a Taylor made double play down to Garner. Over to Foley and back to Stargell. The second double play pulled off by the Bucks today. So Murray, after the hot start, is now four for 12. That's true. And Bibby is holding together. And remember, as history is, he gets past the fifth inning. Tough, tough, and tough. This is DeSense. Who's hands are those? There he is. <laughs> Kent to Cull. Bethel Park, Pennsylvania. We met him yesterday up close in person. Three balls, no strikes, two outs. 5-3 Pittsburgh. We're in the top of the sixth. This wow. will be Bibby's 99th pitch of the game. And he walks him with it. Regardless of his reputation for hanging tough in the late innings, the number of pitches he has already thrown, it would seem, have to take their toll on the arm. Well, the big thing about it, it's a little peculiar. He's That's only his second walk. He's just thrown a lot of pitches this afternoon. You, that's all. You want a figure that's astonishing? Scott McGregor, as there's a little huddle on the mound, Scott McGregor yesterday threw 96 pitches, 78 of them were strikes. Well, he didn't fool around. You look at him and Flanagan, and that's one thing about Gary Renegade. Baltimore. They go right after you. They don't waste a lot of time. They, during the course of the season, now here in this series, we've seen a little wildness of Steve Stone, and that could be just his first World Series game jitter. But they go right after you. Here's Renneke. Action again in the Pirate bullpen. Don Robinson. That's the third time that he's been up and throwing. He's worked almost as many innings as Bibby. <laughs> Doing two to Renneke. Bibby trying to get out of the Baltimore six. Fans, they get up. They're looking for the strikeout. Right field playable. Parker started back and now comes on. And that is out number three. So Baltimore gone in the sixth inning and after five and a half it remains 5-3 Pittsburgh. Here's Jim Bibby to lead off the Pittsburgh sixth. Looks at a curveball for a strike. 0-2. Oh Got him looking. Now Bibby strikes out as you take another look at it. Stone had his problems in the fifth inning, gave up a run, but then worked out of further trouble. Takes care of Bibby here in what will be his final inning of work as you look at Jim Palmer, the starting pitcher in game two. And he'll be back. the starter in game six. He will be back, that young man. He told me today, I really feel great now. My arm is back. Now well, the young man sitting next to him was the winner opening night, Mike Flanagan, and he'll go tomorrow. Here's Omar Moreno. One for three this afternoon. Three balls, two strikes to Moreno. On the hands to Dower. To Murray. And there's two gone. Here's the young man who provided the insurance run, Tim Foley. Tim Foley. Led off the fifth inning with a walk against Steve Stone. That was Steve's undoing. Now there's two gone. Foley the hitter, two for two this afternoon. As Howard said, he walked his last time at bat and scored. Line to right, and Foley's three for three.
Now Tim Foley's bat comes to life here this afternoon. His third base hit as he stands at first base. And that brings on Dave Parker with two outs. And the Bucks leading 5-3. Parker is hit into a double play. He's flying to center, and his last time at bat, he singled. That was also against Steve Stone. DeSense, look where he's playing at third. He's out on that imaginary line and way off the line at third. Before this series is over, this big guy got to hit one out. It just seems inevitable. That line, kind of the line that would be from the, you're playing on grass and dirt, that would be where the outfield grass meets the skin part of the infield. That's how deep the Desense is playing. Two balls and no strikes. Ball oh. three, three and oh. And Grant Jackson up and throwing in the Pittsburgh bullpen. That's Foley at first. Shows you the way Tanner's thinking ahead. He knows that Weaver has saved his left-handed pinch hitters. Well, he's got Kelly, he's got Lowenstein. But Lowenstein has not really hit well since he injured his ankle. He green-lighted him 3-0, and, oh, and he went after ball four. He really did. Runner goes. Left field, shallow, Renicky and Garcia, and it's going to drop, and it goes by Renicky. Here comes Foley on the double by Parker. It is six to three, Pittsburgh. Again, yet another fielding laps, and this one instrumental here as Parker with a big swing. Renicky was playing relatively deep. He came loping in initially as if he thought maybe Garcia had a chance and Kiko had none whatsoever. And then Renicky, once he does get there, tries to short hop it, the ball bouncing high off the garden turf, and that costs Baltimore a run. And good hustle by Foley, who was running on the 3-2 pitch. He scores all the way from first base as Stargell stands in. In the meantime, Pittsburgh is in the process of icing this ball game. That's their 14th hit of the afternoon, but they've got six runs to show for. That's one of the tough plays right there. The big swing, Renicky was playing very deep. But when you get up on top of that ball, that's fouled away. 0 and 2 the count. You've got to play very deep in all parts of the ballpark on Dave Parker. We have had some long ball games. Well, they have been long. Tim Stoddard gets up to join Tippy Martinez down in the Baltimore bullpen. Got it. Huh. Now Pittsburgh is gone in the sixth inning, but they pick up a run on two hits as you look at this pitch again. Good sinker. And through six, it is six to three, Pittsburgh. That's the story from Three River Stadium here in Pittsburgh. I'm Don Drysdale with Al Michaels and Howard Cosell. Pittsburgh on top by a score of 6-3. Six runs on 14 hits in an air through six. And Baltimore, three runs, five hits, no errors. As we get ready to go to the seventh, and once again for the play, here's Al. All right, Don, the bottom of the order for Baltimore. That's Dower, Skaggs, and a pinch hitter for Stone coming up. The Pirates broke out on top in the second inning with four. The Orioles picked up three in the third. And then the Pirates have added single runs in the fifth and in the sixth as they try to even the series. Dower has popped out and singled the left. One for two. Fly ball to right center field. Marino waves Parker off. And there's one guy. There are continuing nuances in a, in a series like this where the teams ride an elevator exchanging victories, but very clearly certain things do emerge. The artificial turf did not help Baltimore on that play by Renicky, because if Renicky were familiar with artificial turf, he could have anticipated that errant bounce that led to the sixth pirate run. Dave Skaggs, 
One and oh the count. Stone due up next, and Pat Kelly has come out into the on-deck circle for the Orioles. Foul away in the count of two and two. In the bullpen for the Pirates. The right-hander is Don Robinson, and the lefty is Grant Jackson, as Bibby has thrown 111 pitches in six in the third inning. Three and two. Yeah, it'll just give you an example of how strong Jim Bibby really is. Throwing now 112 pitches. He's been in some jams and he's still humping it up there at 92 or 93 plus. Well, he hasn't been in jams recently. And that's the key. He gets stronger once past that fifth inning, as I have stated. Hit to the hole by Madlock for a base hit. Skaggs has his first hit of the day. And that's hit number six off Bibby. So now Pat Kelly will come up with Skaggs at first base and one down. Kelly, the second pinch hitter utilized by Weaver today. Lee May came up in the fifth inning and struck out. Well, this is exactly why Earl saved his left-handed pinch hitters. Using Kelly now, and he's got Crowley. He's also got Lowenstein if he wants to try him despite the sore ankle. Weaver. Now well, there's a the lineup car. They'll just put it up there. That shows you the Baltimore lineup. And they'll just make the changes on the lineup as the game goes along. Half swing, little bouncer to the right side. Stargell looked at second, then goes back, and no, he was not on the bag. They call him safe as they contend Garner was not on the bag. Jim McKean made the call, and Chuck Tanner is right there. <laughs> Well, Garner thought he caught the outside part of the bag, and McKeon said, nope, you stood right here, you missed it. You got to be careful when you're Tanner, because you get that chew of tobacco over there in your cheek, and all of a sudden you get out there arguing, it becomes dislodged. Boy, you can, let's take another look at it. He might have slid off. He didn't appear to touch it, but with really the angle in this case isn't that good but it doesn't matter the decisions made and suddenly let's isolate on Willie on the play Willie Sud wants to go to second base I think Howard now that's what cost Willie right there taking that time to look at second deciding against it now from that angle, it makes it look like it was outside the base. But Meanwhile, Tanner has gone from first base to the mound, and Bibby will be coming out here in the seventh, six to three, Pirates. Well, Grant Jackson brought in, conceivably to pitch to just one man. That would be Bumbry, who is up right now. Bumbry, a left-handed batter, and in the bullpen, the Pirates with two right-handers, Don Robinson and Kent Tocolby are both throwing. So if Jackson takes care of Bumbry, we very well might see Tanner bring in Tocolby. That's true. Now they didn't exactly shell Jim Bibby. Skaggs got a sing eye single. Bibby had been getting progressively stronger. And then there was that garbage half swing hit <laughs> by uh, Kelly. But he'll take it. Oh, sure. So the tying run is at the plate. Bumbry is one for three. Outside, ball one. Hi, right, ball two. It's two and all on Bumbry. On deck, the right hand batting, Kiko Garcia. And it's three and all. The 3 0 pitch, Bumbry taken all the way, and it's three and one. Got the corner, three and two. All right. That's what Chuck Tanner was looking for. That was a tough three-one pitch. The three-two to Bumbry. Bouncing ball hit down to Foley to corner one. That's the first. They double it. 
No runs, two hits, man left. Jackson does the job in the middle of the seventh. It remains six to three, Pittsburgh. Now let's take a look at that double play that ended that little uprising by Baltimore. Foley to Garner. Now the return throw to Stargell. Very close at first base. Jimmy Fry, the first base coach, he kind of jumped up in the air on that call. As you look at the new Baltimore pitcher, Big Tim Stoddard. Now you look at this, you'll see Willie cheated just a little bit, which is the mark of the good first base. Close play, and Jim McKeon right there to make the call. Here is the huge one, Stoddard. They go from the 5'10", Steve Stone, to the 6'7", Tim Stoddard. Former basketball player at North Carolina State. Teammate of David Thompson there. Was the Wolfpack won an NCAA championship. And coming up, of course, immediately following this one, Oklahoma and Texas. The game has not yet started. Still pre-game festivities, so you do not figure to miss much of any of it. Oklahoma and Texas. John Miller. John Miller. Marion Melvin. And there's husband John. And as you look back on this ball game, this guy got as big a hit as there was. A double down the right field foul line with two on. And he built up the fifth run. Brought it in with that hit for the Bucks. That put him not one run ahead of the Birds, but two. Gave him a little breathing room as the count goes to 0-2. Milner, Madlock, and Ott. Stoddard, signed by the White Sox, released by Chicago, picked up by Baltimore. Spent some time on the disabled list this year as Milner hits a fly ball. The shallow left, Garcia goes out, and Kiko will put this one away. So one down here in the seventh inning, and up comes Madlock. This has been a long ball game. It's been a ball game of squandered opportunity after squandered opportunity by both sides. Correct, Windy? Yes, sir. I would have to say that. It's been kind of a funny series in a way. You, you came into. <laughs> that is not Bob Uke. How do you know? <laughs> That was Bob Euchre with a cigar. <laughs> Do it on the count on Madlock. You know, we've had, we really have, we've had lousy weather, to say the least. And you look at these two ball clubs, and they've executed well throughout the course of the year. And we've seen some shoddy play throughout the course of this. But, you've, gosh, you've got to attribute that to... Really, I would say 99 and 9 tenths percent of that to the bad weather that we've had. But it's been bad weather for both sides. Three and one account. You know, you talk about the good play Madlock made before, the instrumental play at third. It's interesting because at one point a couple of years ago, the Giants thought he couldn't play third anymore, moved him over to second. Then when the deal was made with Pittsburgh, they put him back. Ball four, and it was a big deal for Pittsburgh because that took Garner off at third and put him at second. It's exactly right. They knew they needed help because in the infield, Rennie Stennett, and it's really a tragic case because he was one of the finest second basemen in all of baseball. A couple of years ago, broke his ankle. Hasn't played up to his ability since because of the injury. They needed help. They moved Garner over to second, put Matt Lock at third. That's Mrs. Eddie Ott. Oh, and one. They said Madlock. The pitch is inside. Skaggs' throw is a beauty. It really was. I tell you, he threw that ball like Dempsey. He got rid of it great. This pitch up and in. Out a little. Now he gets it up in the webbing, and there's a chance where you can't reach in and get it cleanly, but he's got it right on the money and a good tag by Garcia. So two down with the bases empty. 
One ball, two strikes, a count on Ott. Look at it. Hit back off Stoddard, <laughs> and it rolls right down to Murray, who's going to make the play. That looks like one of those, that looked like one of those Steve Miserak pool shots. <laughs> I'm just plain showing off. I Dude. guarantee you that hurt. You can hear that crack all the way up here. Got him in the shin. Look at that. Right to Murray. End of seven, it's still six to three. <laughs> Pittsburgh will be back in Pittsburgh after this word from our local stations. Two switches for the Pirates. Bill Robinson goes in for defensive purposes, replacing John Milner in left field, and Don Robinson comes in to pitch. So Grant Jackson was called out of the bullpen to face one man, Al Bumbry, did the job, got Bumbry to hit into a double play to end the top of the seventh inning, and now they put it in the hands of Don Robinson, who appeared in games one and two, had last night off, and back in here to try to pick up the save. Here's the lineup tonight on ABC. And what a lineup it is, my friend. First two hilarious new comedy hits, The Ropers and Detective School. Following, it's an all-star love boat. Then Bob Wagner and Stephanie Powers in a great new adventure series, Heart to Heart. All tonight, beginning at 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central Time. ABC still the one. Too bad you're going to miss it, though, because I am going to take it to that hockey game tonight. <laughs> that will be the day. <laughs> <laughs> Eighth inning at six to three, Pittsburgh. See, they're right with us. Kiko Garcia. Scout Charlie Walgren's got to be a proud man, just retired after last night's performance. He was the man who signed Garcia. Looks in a strike. Then they also signed the Angels manager, Jimmy, Jimmy Fergosi. Specializes in short stops. <laughs> Donnie Robinson. One two pitch, loop the shallow right field. Parker got a late start and has a short hop, and it's a base hit for Garcia. Dave did misjudge it. It appeared that he might have lost it for a moment. Well, Maybe this replay will show you how Dave took the big swing, hit it out on the end of the bat. Parker still has not started to come in now, coming in, and then just has to short hop. The point is, he went back. He did. It's fooling. You see Garner pointing there, Parker hesitates. And that's what a good infielder will do. An infielder will go back, and the first thing they'll do, they'll be pointing in the air and helping that outfielder out. Ken Singleton at the plate. One and oh. I can hear that whistle sitting up here in the booth, and we've talked that Pee Wee Reese has been around, and Pee Wee, of course, with that whistle, after you've heard it for a few years, you know what it is, but a ball would go up, and right away, Pee Wee would whistle. That would be his sign to the outfielders. When you heard him whistle and pointing that finger in the air, you knew, come on in. 2-1 pitch is hit off the glove of Foley and out in the left field. And stopping at second, Garcia. So the birds don't give up. Watch this. Great effort. Play. Great oh, effort by Tim Foley. Foley. Timmy making the dive. Just got a glove on the ball, but he, I don't know if he could have made a play on it if he had come up with it anyway. If ever a guy is due, it's Eddie Murray. So suddenly, Robinson's in trouble. Not totally his fault. Parker going back on a ball he should have come in for. Murray Look shatters out. the bat. The ball bounced down to Foley to Garner for one. He goes back to third. No play there. So runners at first and third, one out. And the meat part of the bat winds up in the stands back of first base. Boy, that bat really did splinter. It went over just over the commissioner's box. And First baseman, Doug and Sensei. So nobody got hurt seriously. Sensei started the series with a two-run home run. Has had nothing since. Has not hit the ball well except for one time when he shot one to deep right center. Off Robinson, by the way. A great catch by Parker. 
One and no the count. Doug has walked twice today and flied out. He's a fastball hitter. That accounts for at least some of his success against Gidry. He's hit four home runs against Gidry, which takes him doing. One and one. Boy, that fastball really dove in on him. Mm. 94 miles per hour. Putting everything into it. And the 1-1 one -one pitch. Look out. Well, and you're bringing it up there 90-some miles an hour. You better make your move fast. And that's exactly what Desense did right here. There was a little element of doubt, and he says, Pasadena, I'll see you later. <laughs> you want to get out doubly quick when it's 40 degrees, too. That's a whole, <laughs> yeah. This is Terry Bradshaw will be taking the ice immediately after the game. <laughs> <laughs> Jojo. Two one pitches Ooh. foul back. Two and two. He had a swing at that. He was just about on that one. Well, the fans aren't rooting for a rally. They're rooting for a strikeout here. And they almost get one. They appeal. No. Ball three. Three and two. They do build up the tension, don't they? The three-two pitch coming up. Ball four to load them up. So the bases are loaded with one out here in the eighth inning. And Gary Renicky is the batter. Chuck Tanner. He still has to Colby in the bullpen. Talking it over with Harvey Haddix, the pitching coach. To Colby sneaking a peek over toward the dugout to see if Chuck had made any move. Now Terry is going to go get him. Here he goes. Let's see if Weaver stays with Renneke. He's made the motion. They'll go to the bullpen and they'll go to Tacovi. Weaver has Terry Crowley and John Lowenstein, left-handed batters. Well, back here in Pittsburgh, you look at the man that Tanner wants in this situation, Kent Tacovi, coming in, 31 saves and 10 wins on the season. A lot of people love Kent Tacovi here. And Mrs. Kent to Colby, and I suspect we'll see Mr. John Lowenstein. Well, here comes Lowenstein with the bases loaded and one out. Pirates on top, six to three in the top of the eighth inning. To Colby, the fourth pitcher. Employed by Tanner today. Kent went to the well 94 times during the season. And of course, he will go to the well every day until the water runs dry. Here's a tough job for a pinch hitter. You've been sitting in this cold, cold weather, and all of a sudden, here you are, one out in the eighth inning, and you're asked to come up and deliver. One oh. one. Well, he did it in game one, of course, of the playoffs in Baltimore, beating the Angels with an opposite field home run. Hit well. Back, back. Home run. Lowenstein, a home run. And the Orioles win it. Six to three. He did that. But apart from that one hit, John has not been hitting much of anything at all. And Palmer says it's the anchor. The 0 1 pitch. Up and away. Bases loaded. Garcia at third. Murray, the runner at second. And Desensei at first. One out in the eighth inning. Six to three, Pittsburgh. 
The 2-2 pitch is ripped by oh. Virgil and into the corner. Garcia comes in to score. Parker has trouble with it. Murray comes in to score. They stop the Senze at third. It's a double and it's six to five. How can you ask for more? It's another one-run ball game at this moment. And indeed, he hit this ball a ton. Watch this. He crushed it. That ball got by Stargell in a hurry and down into that corner in a hurry. And now this isn't the problem. The problem right now, that ball just about got by Parker. Right there, a great barehanded save, or we've got a tie game. Murray, you can see him. He wanted the sensei to come in, but Cal Ripken stops him at third. With one out in the inning, runners at second and third. And they go to the bench again. This time, instead of Dower, we're going to see Billy Smith. Billy Smith, the switch hitter, coming up to face to Colby. Started games one and two, one for six in those games. Up on the floor, number two, Billy Smith. Will and so the double Dower. By Lowenstein, the first man to reach base off to Colby in the World Series. It is six to five. And they will walk Smith. They'll put him on with Skaggs due up next. And we'll see. But there's a fellow Weaver named counter. Crowley still there to be used. That's right. Crowley was out in the on deck circle. And I think right now, Earl Weaver. He's got Smith in there. Of course, he'll stay in the game and play second base, hitting in Dower's spot. And you still have a man named Crowley, as you say, although it is Skaggs, it's coming out. Well, this is where you got to give a man credit. Skaggs is coming out. Dempsey trotting in from the bullpen, and all of a sudden he saw Skaggs in the on deck circle. He stopped. Now he comes there. There he through. comes. It didn't make any sense. And yep. there is Crowley. This is what we talked about at the start of the ball game, gentlemen. Weaver saving these left handed pinch hitters for the right moment. And it's proved out for him. You second guess this guy once, you second guess him twice, but somehow it proves out. I go back to that inning when he let Sammy Stewart bat for himself. And you were openly critical, Don, and I felt the same way. Well, I was talking about the bunt situation. Well, that too, you were, That's yes. What I was talking about. That was back in the third when he let Stewart hit. Sammy stayed in the game, kept his bench intact. And now he used he uses his third consecutive pinch hitter. Lowenstein with a double. They walk Smith. And now Crowley with the bases loaded takes outside ball one. Whether he ties the game or not, Earl Weaver's entire game plan now in focus. And at this point in time becomes the storyline of the game. Pirate infield, double play depth. With the bases loaded, the 1 0 pitch is beaten foul off to the right. One and one. Got the outside corner, and Crowley doesn't like that call at all. Frankly, I don't blame him. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this one again, Twin D. Close pitch. One and two. Chop foul. You know, sometimes you just sit back and think, and Earl Weaver right now, he's yelling for a base hit. You know that. Tacovi has worked in the last two games. He worked an inning in the second game, two innings last night. And now coming back today, and after being in 90 four games in the course of the regular season. Crowd chanting, let's go Bucks. The one two to Crowley is way outside, two and two. Weaver going deep into his bench. They have only two non-pitchers who've not been used, Belanger and Ayala. And Dempsey. Don't forget Rick Dempsey. Because in my opinion, that's the man he might go to. The 2-2 pitch is lined into the right field corner. And Baltimore will take the lead as the Sensei comes in to score to tie it. 
Smith follows to make it 7-6, to six, and the Orioles have come up with four in the eighth, a double for Crowley. It's hard to believe, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen, the way that man uses the entire the roster, the way every man comes through at just the right time. Look at them. There is joy there, and you can understand it, but the little cocky banner, he's the guy. They ought to give him if Baltimore should win the game ball. <laughs> the whole 108 stitches. So the Orioles have overtaken the Pirates with a 7 to 6. Still only one out and runners at second and third. And he stays with Stoddard. Harry Crowley off the bench. He and Lowenstein both producing two run doubles in the eighth inning. Tim Stoddard up for the first time in 79. Bouncer by Madlock through the drawn in infield. That'll score a run. Crowley stops at third, and it's eight to six. <laughs> I don't believe it. Incredible. I don't believe it. Well, there's that ball again, just a high hopper, and there's a artificial surface base hit, a one hopper by Madlock. They can only pick up one run as Robinson got on the ball in a hurry. And Stoddard, as you said, hasn't swung a bat all year long. Well, he has in batting practice. Baltimore's pitchers have been... That's <laughs> Stoddard's first hit in organized baseball. He never had a hit in the minors or the majors. He got a big hit at this time. It's a crazy World Series, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely crazy. But let's go back to the very beginning. Only if the Bucks should lose this game, only three teams have ever rallied to win a series from a three to one deficit in games. The Tigers in 68. The Yankees in 58 against the then Milwaukee Braves. The Tigers did it to the Cardinals. And in 1925, when it was Forbes Field, the Bucks did it against the then Washington Senators. And if you want to look back, go to that second inning. The... There's your runner on third base. That's Dempsey, who goes in to pinch run here. Dempsey was going to come into the game anyway to do the catching since they hit for Skaggs. And there is Crowley. See how the Bucks' two malfeasances in the second inning done now loom so important. They got four runs, a four-nothing lead. Didn't seem like anything. But boy. Now Bumbrey. Well, you to capitalize on opportunities, always caution. Now there'll be some second guessing about the use of Tecolby again because he'd been used in the last two games. One and one, especially last night. We remarked about it when he came into a game in which they were down by four. Yeah, but they never second guessed Chuck Tanner when he used Kent 94 times in the regular season. And indeed, the arm has been rubber. Bumbrey, the ninth man to hit in the inning. The Orioles have scored five to lead it eight to six. Bumbrey hits a chopper. This is going to be a tough play for Foley, who goes to Garner. One, that's all they get, and the Orioles get another run. As Dempsey comes in to score from third on the course, and it is nine to six. You turn around, they got six runs, and you think through the whole inning, and you wonder how they did it. <laughs> They've been that kind of a ball club. They have just been fantastic. Look at Stoddard. You think they're not happy with him? He'll never forget that base hit. He's going to become one of Weaver's right-handed pinch hitters. Here's the man who got it all started. Let off in the eighth inning with a base hit, the tenth man to bat. Six runs and five hits in the inning for the Orioles. On one. And let's go back to that base hit. It was a base hit that Parker appeared to lose for a moment. Right? That's Absolutely right. right. Singleton followed with a hit. Murray hit into a force. Desenze the walk. And then the big blows, the doubles by Lowenstein and Crowley. Oh, and to the count. You can't 
You can have the opportunities Pittsburgh has been given and squandered as many as they have. And even as Don mentioned Parker missed playing Garcia's single. Remember the three-run rally, uh, the, the three-run rally in the third for the Birds was started by Matlock's error. They send Bumbrey, but it's academic because Garcia strikes out. The inning is over, but the damage was done. Six runs, five hits in the middle of the eighth inning. Baltimore nine, Pittsburgh six. Here are the changes now as we go to the bottom of the eighth inning. John Lowenstein stays in the game in left field. Billy Smith stays in the game at second base. And the pinch runner, Rick Dempsey, stays in the game back of the plate as Phil Garner leads off. <laughs> oh, and won the count. I still don't believe this game. I don't believe Weaver. He let start it back. The guy never got a hit in organized baseball. Anybody else would have put up a pinch hit. The guy gets a hit. Little squibber. Goddard has it, gets Garner. <laughs> and the way he utilized his pinch hitters, that was the key. It's amazing how quickly you go from dummy to genius, I don't you? I gave you the whole story. If they threw Earl in the River Charles, he'd yep. come up on the other <laughs> bank with a fruit stand. <laughs> Bill Robinson, he's batting in the number nine spot. He was inserted there when he came in to replace Milner. A strike. The pitcher, to Colby, is hitting in the number five spot. So we're down at the bottom of the order with Marino waiting on deck. <laughs> Owen to the count. Robinson is gone. I'll guarantee you one thing. That big guy out there on the mound right now, he is bringing it. This one right here clocked at miles an hour, Don. <laughs> he just threw it by him. Well, it's going to be interesting if this score stays the way it is right now. You know the Bucks, their backs are to the wall. Let's we'll see what they can do tomorrow to come back. Two out, bases empty. Marino takes inside. They ever give the MVP, the Babe Ruth Award, to a manager? Uh, <laughs> did you ever see a manager get a hand like Weaver got in Baltimore when he was introduced? Well, you'd have to do it. When you look at this right here, he would have to go right at the top of the list of things that he's done. He has proved something to me. I've seen <laughs> Earl for the last, I don't know, eight years in the American League and broadcasting American League games, but he has shown me something here that I just, I'm scratching my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's begun to bleed. <laughs> <laughs> he's something else. Remember, it was 4 0 Pittsburgh after two. 6 3 Pittsburgh after seven. He had one the wheels. With the best relief core in the business. Ground ball off the glove of Garcia. He slips down to Marino. Picks up his second hit and his fifth in the series. Well, Moreno got it out on the end of the bat. He just hits it where nobody can make a play on it. That's all. Garcia gives it A for effort, but he's not going to be able to make a play even if he comes up with the ball. And Johnny Lowenstein just finishing out to throw it back in. Ray Miller goes to the mound tomorrow in game number five. We know that Mike Flanagan will be pitching for the Orioles. We assume Bruce Keeson for the Pirates. And then game six, if necessary, on Tuesday, full pack. Don Stanhouse. Get ready. Stand the man <laughs> unusual. Get into the full pack. <laughs> well, if Weaver can take it with Stan, so can we. Tim Foley's had a perfect day. Three singles and a walk. He scored twice. He's now five for 16 on the series. Oh, and one the count. The Pirates with 15 hits, but only six runs. The Orioles with a dozen hits and nine runs. Slow bouncer to Garcia. Keep both going to first, and it's dug out by Murray to end the eighth inning. Good play by Eddie as Foley flips his helmet. Back toward the Pirate dugout. Tim Foley went down the line as hard as he could possibly go down the line. And just the old saying, you just can't outrun that baseball sometimes. So eight ball in the Bucks at Three Rivers. It's nine to six, Baltimore.
to the ninth inning. It's nine to six, Baltimore. The Orioles trying to make it three out of four. And Ken Singleton will be leading off. Eddie Murray and Doug DeSensei to follow against Kent to Colby. Want to know the count. When the Pirates have battled back on year, who knows what they'll do in the bottom of the ninth. If they can contain Baltimore here in the top of the ninth. Two and one. For those of you expecting football, it's still going to come. Oklahoma just scored a touchdown on a fast play. They lead the Texas Longhorns seven to three. But this is baseball, a topsy-turvy World Series game. Garner throwing out Singleton. I don't care what the denials will be from the Bucks. If they lose this game, they have to be psychologically shell-shocked. They dominated the game until the eighth inning. They squandered countless opportunities, and they are still showing the same frailty, making the key defensive misplay. Matt Locke's error and Parker misplaying Garcia's single. Well, we said before, you're going to go back and look at that second inning when they scored four runs. Actually. And there, errors of, of commission yep. on the base paths. They gave themselves two outs. Baltimore got only one. Two another cat. <laughs> Joe Torrey, yes. match manager. Joe, I wonder how you feel when you look at Singleton and <laughs> when you look at the other Mets. He is a lovely man. Garner up with this one. And it's that for Murray. Two down. So Eddie today, 0 for 5. You're complimenting the Baltimore club. Look in this World Series, you'll see they gave away a game, the second game of the series. And they came back immediately and won in the opposition ballpark on the strange turf. That's right. If they if they would have picked up that second game, this would have been number four. It might be all over today. Two down. The base is empty. The sensei today, 0 for one, and he's walked three times. One and zero. Two and zero. The count. Wonder what the weather is in Greenland. <laughs> Mark Belanger, Kenny Singleton. All of them now leaning forward, tense, eager, hoping that thing gets over. Three and zero on the sensei, who's already drawn three walks. And the sensei on again. So Doug has drawn four walks today in a game that right now is at the three-hour and thirty-six minute mark. And if it winds up as a nine-inning game, it'll be the longest nine-inning game in World Series history. And here's the man who got the first big hit with the sacks clawed, Johnny Lowenstein. A double into the right field corner. A ball that, as Don Drysdale said, he absolutely crushed. <laughs> he did just that. He hit it hard. Garner for this one. And Phil takes care of everybody in the inning. At the end of eight and a half, it remains Baltimore nine, Pittsburgh six. <laughs> Benny Ayala is now the only non-pitcher Earl Weaver has not used as he inserts Mark Belanger in at shortstop as we go to the bottom of the ninth inning. And this ABC Sports exclusive is being brought to you by Chevrolet. Like baseball, hot dogs, and apple pie, Chevy is an American favorite. See the exciting lineup of 1980 Chevrolets at your Chevy dealers. By Lowenbrow, when you want the taste of a truly great American beer, there's really only one. Tonight, let it be Lowenbrow. And by Actra, for closeness with comfort, it's Gillette's best shade. Bottom of the ninth inning, Parker, Stargell, and a pinch hitter. Ken Stoddard. There's no quit in this crowd. It's kind of a good thing. We saw it between innings and during the break. They stood as one. And to Sister Sledge's rendition of We Are Family, they danced and sang together. And they cheered Dave Parker when he got up. I said it yesterday, I say it again. It's something to see the spirit in Baltimore and Pittsburgh and what a successful sports franchise can do for a city.
One and one. Misses Dave Parker. Amongst a crowd of more than 50,000. And they are shell-shocked, but as Howard just said, lively as we go to the bottom of the ninth inning. Parker on a check swing. It's in there anyway for a strike, and the count is one and two. What a pitch that was. Kent to Colby. Now this pitch right. Dave wanted to try and maybe go. He didn't want to pull the trigger, but it caught the right at the knee. Got him looking on the inside corner. Dave Parker and strikes out. David Noah. <laughs> David Noah. Great professional that he is. He was caught with that tight pitch. Stargell, a home run and a double. Grounded into center field for a base hit. So the Bucks get a man on with one out as Willie picks up his third hit of the day and his seventh in the series. What a remarkable player. And he symbolizes this Pittsburgh club. He's its leader. On the See, Stargell, Stargell talking to the catcher, Rick Dempsey. Dempsey saying, yelling something down to Willie. And how in the world did you hit that? Yeah, pitch? that's what he said. He said, why did you even hit that pitch? <laughs> Here is Mike Easler. Pinch hitting. With one out in the bottom of the ninth inning. Mike Easler is batting for Jacoby. Mike Easler. Easler batting for Jacoby. Madlock on deck. Stigel at first base. Well, the key base hit of the ball game right now belongs to that big man standing in the middle of the diamond. Stoddard. Stoddard. That's Stoddard. why the whole thing is... <laughs> Easler hits it in the air to left field, but Longstein has a play and makes the catch. That's why Weaver is the storyline of this game. Everything he did was against the book. Unorthodox. And he made it all work. Or at least his team did. Third baseman, Bill Madlock. Bill Madlock with two out in the ninth inning. Now the fans begin to drift out. There he is. He is a genius. He <laughs> there's, is. There's always a kind of twinkle in his eye, even when he's losing, you know? <laughs> he enjoys what he does. He enjoys the fullness of his life. Three and two, two out. Ed Ott is on deck. Madlock pops it foul. Back of first, Murray will give chase but run out of room. Three and two. Here's the man that Stoddard wants right here. He does not want to have to go to Ott representing the tying run. Not only that, Eddie can hit it out on. Oh, yeah. He's a southpaw hitter, and he can hit it out on. Well, Stan, Decent power. Stan House and Martinez are throwing in the Baltimore bullpen. That's up. That's Martinez, a left-hander. Stan House, a right-hander. Madlock hits it to center field, and Bumbrey will have to play it on a hop. So the Pirates keep it alive, and the tying run will come to the plate. Quit. They never heard word neither of these two teams 17 hits for the Bucks started one strike away from victory but Matlock a truly exceptional hitter and now Eddie Ott tying run at the plate the potential tying run there the, there's the graphic and gives you the story Weaver's going to stay with Stoddard, knowing that if he brings in Martinez, Tanner would figure to go to the bench, maybe for Rennie Sennett. So off the tying run at the plate. 0-1. Oh and one. Ooh, he had a swing. I mean, you talk about unbuttoning those top few buttons and take a good swing. He did just that. The other man that... Tanner could have gone to had the left-hander come in would have been Lee Lacey. But we that figured, man you don't want to bring right. in. We were figuring, you don't want to see come in. Hit five pinch hit home runs for the Dodgers in Lasorda. 
So Weaver, figuring he's better off having Stoddard pitch to Ott. And Stoddard is airing it out right now. I'll tell you that. Stargell at third and Madlock at first. The 1-1 one -one pitch is fouled back. One and two. Crowd. We'll be going right to the Cotton Bowl at the conclusion of this one. Oklahoma leading Texas 7-3 early second quarter. One and two. What a ball game. What a pair of teams. Foul out of play again. Hot hanging tough. Started not wanting to get the ball up and out. Well, Ott can get a hold of it. Send it out of sight. Well, the one thing we haven't had is a home run hit to right. That foul it. tipped and held by Dempsey. So Baltimore goes up three games to one. The Orioles, for the second day in a row, come from behind. And that symbolizes the Pirate frustration. They cannot believe it. Earl Weaver. What a job of manipulating and maneuvering. And the Orioles win it by a score of 9-6. to six. The Orioles close the gap. And now it's Tanner's bullpen against Weaver's bench. In the early innings, Weaver saves his left-handed pinch hitter, John Lowenstein, and Terry Crowley. But in the eighth, trailing 6-3, Weaver draws his hand. The bases are full of birds. Having used lefty Grant Jackson, Tanner must play his ace right-hander, Kent Tocalvi. First, John Lowenstein, pinch hits. Key blow number one. Good for two runs, and Pittsburgh's lead is shaved to 6-5. An intentional walk loads the bases again, and now Terry Crowley pinch hits. blow number two. Good for two more runs. A 7-6 Baltimore lead and a genius rating for Earl Weaver. The shock crowd is silent and all the noise belongs to the Oriole dugout. The triumphant birds finish with a six-run eighth aided by rookie pitcher Tim Stoddard's first professional hit. Weaver let him hit, and then he pitches three scoreless innings. 17 hit, and a pirate lead obliterated by Weaver's strategy and the Orioles' stout 9-6 comeback. Earl's comment, I'll go home tonight knowing I did everything today that I wanted to do.